Hey, Dr. Bernard here. This video is based on a case that's published in literature. Link is in the description below. I don't intend to scare anyone about food or leftovers. I'll be eating leftovers for dinner tonight, just like I do every day. This was a freak accident happening in a perfect storm sequence of events, as I will show you. I publish a video every month, so if you hit subscribe and the bell for notifications, we can have some leftover food together. A student ate his roommate's leftover noodles for lunch. This is what happened to his limbs. JC is a 19-year-old man presenting to the emergency room with muscle pain, chills, and shortness of breath. Five hours earlier, a purplish discoloration that looked like bruises had developed on his skin, and his roommate immediately drove him to the hospital. In the car, JC could barely move his head because his neck was so stiff, but it didn't matter anymore because his vision was starting to go dark. One day earlier, JC was on his regular schedule. He was hungry for lunch, but it was cold outside. Food wasn't easy to come by, but his roommate had gone out to eat the night before and brought back leftovers. He's not really gonna care if I eat this. He wasn't gonna finish it anyways, JC thought. Immediately after eating the meal of leftover chicken and noodles, JC didn't feel well. He could feel his stomach shake and convulse. As the hours passed, JC could feel a blanket of pain covering his stomach. He felt like there was gas, but there was no flatulence. A pool of sour saliva flooded in under his tongue, and he felt a stinging sensation ripple into his cheeks as he was brought down to the floor. He huddled over the toilet as a stream of stomach contents pushed up every couple minutes as he felt his eyes squeezing out of his skull. Laying down now in a world of hurt, JC felt cold. He started shivering. His arms and legs felt weak and clammy, and the blanket of pain started spreading to his chest. It was getting harder to breathe. His head started pounding. He slowly became unaware of his surroundings. When his roommate came back, JC couldn't turn his head to look at him, and his vision was pulsating and starting to blur. That food must have been no good, he thought. I ate your leftovers for lunch, but they came right back up, JC said. Sorry, I should have just tossed it. I didn't finish that dinner because I barfed it up too, his roommate said. As the night passed, JC could feel his heart pounding in his chest. His roommate was fine. JC's head hurt so bad that he was in a fetal position the entire night. What was it about those leftovers, he thought. I shouldn't have eaten them for sure, he thought. As the sun started to rise, JC tried to get up to brush his teeth. He noticed some bruising on his arms and legs that weren't there the day before as he put the toothbrush in his mouth. But everything was in a state of pain and it was just too much. Knowing that an ambulance would be too expensive, he begged his roommate to drive him to the hospital as he's brought to the emergency room where we are now. At examination, JC was responsive, alert, and conscious, but his skin was kind of pale. He had a fever. JC's heartbeat was fast, heart rhythm was normal, but his blood pressure was high and he had tachypnea. Tachy meaning fast and Nia referring to breath. As doctors were examining him, JC empties his stomach all over the floor. Doctors noticed it was a greenish yellow color, not really looking like any particular kind of food. Doctors drew some blood to test and to get a better idea of what's happening. But as the minutes passed, JC's tachypnea started to get worse as he was gasping for air and his face was starting to turn gray. JC has hypoxemia, hypo meaning low, Ox referring to oxygen and emia meaning presence in blood. Low oxygen, presence in blood. But how could this be? He's breathing faster than normal and it's the same air everyone else in the emergency room is breathing and no one else is gasping like how JC is. Doctors put him on supplemental oxygen to try and fix this. As the hour continues, JC's blood pressure drops to half of what it was when he arrived to the emergency room. The nurse used a vein in his leg to administer medicine to stimulate his heart to try and get it to beat harder to increase his blood pressure. Doctors sedate him and stick a tube down his throat so that a machine can breathe for him, but it wasn't enough. JC's blood pressure kept dropping, but then doctors started to notice a rash containing small spots were emerging all over his body. At first, this mottled appearance looked like bruises, but then they became a deep reddish brown, well-defined at the edges, and multiple lesions like this started appearing all over his body. But how could this happen after eating food that made him and his roommate sick? The fever, the sudden drop in blood pressure, the hypoxemia and the diffuse rash, all of this pointing to a sudden, terrible infection spreading all over JC's body as doctors start him on broad spectrum antibiotics. They don't know exactly what bacteria they're dealing with. They don't know what could have caused this to happen. The best that they can do until they find out is to give an antibiotic that covers many different bacteria. 
but things are only getting worse. Doctors try to push more medicines into his body to try to keep his blood pressure up because it keeps going down. Low pressure means that blood can't get into his organs as they start shutting down. They call for a helicopter because he needs to be transported to another hospital with more resources. In the second hospital now, doctors notice that JC's hands and feet are cold. Usually, you can feel a pulse, the heart beating by the hands and the feet, but the medical team couldn't feel one for JC. The lesions look like more than just bruises now, and they've spread everywhere. Occasionally, JC would open his eyes and he would just stare blankly into the void. His pupils still reacted to light. This reflex is natural in humans and means that the brain is still intact. Both of his pupils were the same size, so this tells doctors that his brain is okay, at least for now. What isn't okay is JC's kidneys. At the previous hospital, before putting him into the helicopter, the medical team had placed a catheter that's a tube that will empty the urine in his bladder. But as it turns out, there's no urine in his bladder because his kidneys haven't made any and they've completely shut down. Another blood test finds that JC has thrombocytopenia. Throm from ancient Greek thrombos, meaning a lump or a piece. Cyto meaning cell, and penia from ancient Greek poverty, but in this case referring to deficiency. A deficiency of cell pieces known as thrombocytes, which are also called platelets. But what does this mean? You see, blood has the ability to coagulate. It can clump together to form a kind of jelly-like consistency. This is called a thrombus made from thrombocytes. Another word for all of this is blood clot. This usually happens in times where the body wants to stop you from bleeding. If clots are made of thrombocytes, but JC has a deficiency of thrombocytes, then it means that he can't make any more new blood clots, which would mean that he can't stop bleeding. That could explain his bruise-like rashes all over his body, but JC doesn't have a history of bleeding problems. He was healthy and fine less than 24 hours ago before he ate his roommate's leftover food, meaning at some time in between, this thrombocytopenia developed. If his thrombocytes weren't low before, but are low now suddenly, what happened to them? They could have been destroyed. The remnants of those destroyed would have had to exit JC's body in some form, but where from? He emptied his stomach multiple times after he ate that food. Platelets don't just float into the stomach to be pushed out. JC hasn't made any urine, so they wouldn't have exited from there either, so it's not likely that they were destroyed. Instead, this could mean that JC's thrombocytopenia could be because his body has consumed all of his thrombocytes by making blood clots everywhere in his body. But where exactly would they be? When JC presented to the emergency room at the first hospital, the medical team drew blood and sent it to a lab so they can try and grow the bacteria. On the phone now with the previous hospital, the medical team are told the results. The species found in JC's blood was Neisseria meningitidis the stiff neck, the nausea declining quickly into respiratory collapse and shock, the thrombocytopenia and multi-organ failure, the rash on his cold hands and feet. Doctors had already suspected meningococcemia, meningococcal bacteria presence in blood by the time that these results were confirmed, but at less than 24 hours after eating his roommate's leftover food for lunch, JC's kidneys, lungs, heart, and blood have all shut down. Even though this is a meningococcal bacterial infection, it doesn't appear to be meningitis, the inflammation of the meninges, the membranes that protect the brain and the spinal cord, even though he had a stiff neck called nuchal rigidity. But when he presented to the emergency room, he was conscious, and everything about his brain seemed to be okay. Instead, the bacteria flooded into his bloodstream. So this isn't meningitis, but meningococcemia. But why is this happening? This brings us back to blood clots. We can already see where they are. When JC's body started to react to the meningococcemia, the immune system started responding. It's kind of like getting a cut on your skin. The bleeding stops eventually because of blood clot, and then the area around the cut becomes swollen and warm. It's swollen because the blood vessels dilate so that more blood cells can get to the area, and the swelling is partly due to the fact that there's increased fluid and warmth is the inflammation. But when bacteria is present in the blood, the entire body's blood vessels dilate, dropping the blood pressure, preventing 
oxygen from getting into the organs. Thrombocytes are consumed, causing little clots to form everywhere as they get lodged into small blood vessels, blocking blood flow. As his hands and feet become cold, they're starving of oxygen. A pulse can't be felt because nothing is flowing through as the tissue starts to necrose. The bruising happens because the remaining blood that didn't clot has become thin and is flowing out, looking like a bleed. All of this is called purpura fulminans. Fulminans from Latin fulmin, meaning lightning or thunderbolt, in this case referring to something happening suddenly, and purpura from Greek referring to the color of the bruise that appears suddenly. As the days pass, JC is stabilized, but parts of the tissue on his fingers have necrosed and caused gangrene. Both of his legs down to his feet were also necrosed to the point that they needed to be amputated because the tissue can cause even more problems if it starts floating around JC's body. And then they were amputated. The Neisseria meningitidis bacteria is known to spread through saliva, not through the air, which brings us to the final point. JC's roommate threw up after eating parts of his meal the night before. These became the leftovers that JC ate the next day, not knowing that this had happened. This kind of reaction is generally not normal with food, but as doctors got more medical history on JC, they found that he only received the first dose of the meningococcal vaccine just before middle school and not the booster recommended four years later at age 16. A second serogroup B meningococcal vaccine is usually required for people entering university, which also consists of two separate doses given a couple months apart. JC had gotten this one, but again, only one dose. The evidence appears to point to the food being bad, and that is a freak accident. We'll never know exactly what happened to it to cause it to have Neisseria meningitidis on it. It would be hard to even culture and grow it specifically from the noodles, but we know that bacteria is transmitted through saliva. It made his roommate throw it back up. His roommate was up to date on his vaccination schedule. This bacteria doesn't just materialize out of nowhere, and it caused this infection, it caused parts of JC's limbs to necrose, and the missed partial vaccines twice on JC's part was another accident that happened at this particular place at this particular time. As JC's organ function starts to come back 26 days later, he becomes conscious again and he's moved to the step down unit as his condition starts to improve. Blood products were given to him to replenish the correct coagulation factors in the ICU and other anticoagulants were given aggressively. The bacteria was handled promptly with the correct antibiotics, but the illness caused by it lasted for days. He isn't critically ill anymore, but he has permanent changes on his body now as he was able to make a recovery. Thanks so much for watching. Take care of yourself and be well.